Today we're going to be discussing EdTech. Uh, this panel session is uh, a partnership between WAMDA and Columbia Global Centers and MAN. A few house rules. Uh, if you have questions, please put them into the chat. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on them and we'll answer the questions that you pose to our panelists. So, as the coronavirus swept across the world, forcing people into lockdown, schools and universities were among the first institutions to close their doors. According to UNESCO, 80% of the world's student population, that's about 1.4 billion learners, stayed at home where they attempted to continue their education, much to the exasperation of parents the world over. Schools and universities that had invested in the technological infrastructure had the means to provide distance and online learning. Those with the budgets turned to education technology and the winners, particularly in the Middle East, were the edtech startups that had previously faced difficulties in raising investment. Back in 2017, just $2 million was invested in edtech startups in MENA. So far this year, some $23 million has been raised by edtech startups, according to Wanda's own research. We expect VC investments into EdTech and MENA will rise to $35 million by the end of this year if the same momentum continues. But now that lockdown restrictions are being lifted and a sense of normality is beginning to return, will the EdTech sector continue to thrive? Do we now have a different understanding and expectation of education institutions? Will the pandemic leave a lasting impact on education overall? To answer these questions, we have on this panel, Safwan Masri, Professor and Executive VP for Global Centers and Global Development at Columbia University, Munira Jangjoum, Founder and CEO of Saudi-based EdTech Startup at NAV, and Fadi Ghandour, Executive Chairman at WAMDA. Thank you uh, guys for uh, taking part in this panel discussion. Safwan, I'd like to start with you. How did uh, Columbia University respond to the lockdown and what were the main challenges in providing uh, the education to its students? Thank you. So um, first of all, thank you for hosting this um, incredibly important topic and it's wonderful to be a co-panelist with uh, Monira and Fadi. So Columbia, like most other universities, uh, really had to pivot to online education overnight in mid-March. Um, it all happened very, very quickly. And uh, within three weeks, we had transitioned to online education, offering 9,622 courses uh, to our students across all undergraduate colleges and graduate schools of the university. Um, it, it has been a very difficult, uh, of course, transition, but it worked. It worked very smoothly. And uh, it did because um, the university mobilized its resources very quickly and because we had the technology infrastructure that allowed this to happen. Now, with time to plan over the summer for the next academic year, of course, we have an opportunity to uh, think of more creative ways of delivering education uh, online so that it is not just a matter of flipping a switch and going from a physical classroom to a virtual classroom, expecting the same experience to be replicated. Uh, we have been in the midst of that planning process, unlike other uh, peer universities, uh, some of which have announced, for example, their plans for next year. Uh, Cambridge uh, came out uh, very early on uh, in the process and announced that all of its lectures will be delivered virtually until the summer of 2021. Uh, the University of California system has announced plans to offer most classes online this fall, with some students returning to and staying in dorms, uh, with variations from one campus to another. Um, Columbia will be making its announcement over the next couple of weeks. What we have uh, communicated so far with our student body and with our faculty, of course, um, are a couple of important things. Um, one, we don't expect... Yes, please go ahead. I just want to get a sense of what the challenges were initially. You mentioned that there were some challenges. What were they? Yeah, so the, the challenges, I think, have had to do with, one, uh, the pass-fail system. Right, so we, uh, we went to a pass-fail system, which uh, as you can imagine, competitive, high achieving uh, students um, look for you know, their relative performance in a classroom to distinguish themselves. So that went uh, by the wayside, but at the same time that received a tremendous support from students given the circumstances. One, the, another challenge has been 
the synchronous versus asynchronous components of it. So I think uh, like other universities, we were, we stuck to the same teaching schedule that had been in place uh, through mid-March where students actually appear to the classroom in New York on campus. And now many of them were back home, uh, some of them halfway across the world. And, uh, you know, dealing with uh, the synchronous aspect of classroom delivery, where it might be morning in New York, but uh, the middle of the night in other parts of the world was another issue. Third issue, and what I've been hearing uh, more about from faculty is, as I was saying earlier, it, it's, you know, the way that you deliver a class in person uh, may have to be adjusted and in some cases quite considerably when you are delivering it online. Um, how you um, uh, deliver it, how you interact with the students, how you manage the classroom discussions, all of this, I think, is being taken into account, not only by Columbia, but by other universities who are going into next year to the extent that there will be online education. You might, um, you, you might use, for example, asynchronous lectures where I don't have to be on a Zoom call with my professor as she is teaching the class, but then I join her and some fellow classmates in smaller groups in seminars. Uh, things of that sort. There may be things that can be done to complement uh, what happens online um, that enhances the pedagogic experience. So, you know, the bottom line is I think we did fairly well in pivoting very quickly um, across all schools and doing what needed to be done. Uh, but if you were to come back in September and apply the same model that you applied back in March, I don't think that that would work as well. Okay. Manila, how did uh, you react to the lockdown? How did things change for you? So, um, I mean, uh, for ANAB, we're specifically focusing on uh, online learning, asynchronous online learning and professional development for teachers. So uh, we actually uh, found that it was business as usual for us. Uh, we found a larger number of teachers interested in uh, coming and learning online. Uh, we recently learned that just in the past three months, teachers spent between two to four hours a week on online learning programs, which is unprecedented for Saudi teachers before. Um, there were on-demand skills that uh, teachers were looking for where we had to adapt very quickly and develop like weekly webinars for teachers to learn specific skills, like how do I have effective distance learning? How do I ensure that all my students are learning equally? So there were these fears um, in the sector that you know, we had to respond to um, very quickly to, to our customers and teachers. But for us, it was really business as usual. Uh, we saw a growth in number of registrations, enrollments, interest in professional learning. Um, and I just want to comment on what Professor Safwan said. I, I think the uh, the fastest growth um, to moving online happened in higher education. I mean, before Corona, BC, what they're calling it now, BC and AD after disease, before Corona, only 30% of higher ed students took a course online. After Corona, AD, it's 100% of students in university have taken. So it's a massive shift uh, in the higher education sector. I think it will trickle down to schools and teachers and how we do education in the future. Is that shift going to last, do you think? I think the shift will last, yes. Uh, I do not think that we are, uh, that the K-12 sector is going to go fully online for a very long time, but I think we will find hybrid models and we will find more interest uh, in secondary online schooling, which is something we are seeing increasingly because who succeeded online and intermediate students. The younger students still need to go to school, still need that schooling experience. But secondary online schooling, uh, we think there might be a growth in that as it links very nicely to higher education as well. I want to get a sense of what life was like as a, as a ed tech startup for you. Was it easy to raise investment? How did people receive you when, when you went to pitch? Um, 
So it wasn't easy to raise investment. Uh, um, uh, I would say two years ago, when you knocked on the door of investors and just mentioned the word at tech, um, you would be turned down immediately. Uh, it wasn't an attractive sector, uh, and I understand why it wasn't an attractive sector. Primarily in our region, it's led by the government. It's 80% government in Saudi, it's 60% government in Egypt. So it's a sector that was not unlocked uh, by uh, the private sector yet. Um, so I could see uh, the lack of interest, and it really takes an ed tech company I would say um, quadruple the effort to prove a business model in, in a dynamic of this sector. Um, so uh, it, it really makes me very happy to see uh, the recent investments in uh, ed tech companies at all stages, at seed stage, we've seen series B now. Um, so I think this will change, uh, I mean, significantly in the next couple of years. Um, however, the investment needs to be supported by policy change as well. So we need to see this policy change at the government level to uh, support uh, the companies to grow. Uh, Fadi, what is the VC sentiment with regards to investment in edtech? We've seen it grow, but um, is it likely to continue? Uh, thanks, Triska. Uh, let me talk about investment in the sector in general, not only about VC. Uh, I think VC investors uh, follow trends, uh, look at opportunities, and they follow them. Uh, but the wider sector of investment looks at it from from a uh, from an impact uh, perspective. So, uh, f uh, let me let me just say a, a few things of why we think, as VC and as an investor community, uh, that that tech is 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 here to stay, and and it's going to be the way uh, forward uh, in 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 education, in my view. I mean, this is uh, finally the uh, change uh, and the disruption to uh, 19th and 20th century uh, uh, models uh, are going to be uh, uh, completely changed now. So uh, what COVID did uh, is it has put uh, the 21st century and digital uh, adoption in general, including education, uh, as I've been saying, right in our lab. So what everybody thought this was going to be a long-term process, 10 years, uh, eventually people will go online. It's nice to have uh, uh, distance learning. It's nice to have uh, digital uh, uh, capabilities, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, And so the, the coronavirus basically got us into a two-month experiment. Uh, forced us into a two months experiment uh, to actually become digitally enabled immediately, right? So uh, it, it forced things on us. And it also it proved that uh, the internet is so robust, right? When everyone went online, the internet was still there. The infrastructure did not fail us. And we were people in general, the educators, the learners, knew exactly where to go, knew exactly what to do. I mean, uh, they improvised. Uh, it could have been much better, obviously. Uh, but this experiment basically accelerated everything that we thought was going to happen in 10 years or even more and sometimes and basically said it's here. It's here right now. And it forced adoption. Uh, uh, what, you, what Munira was saying earlier about, you know, uh, two years ago as an education company would, have, would I have been able to raise uh, and the question would have been known. And you know, the, the core story for this as an investor was adoption. Because you could put courses online, you could spend money to, uh, to build the infrastructure for education. It is getting the users to say, I want to go online and I want to do it and I'm willing to spend the money for it. It's getting the parents to think about it seriously and not only as a play or as a nice thing to have or as a fad. It's no longer optional. You know, the COVID, it challenged uh, uh, the lockdown, let me say. Uh, we all got used to new words, right? Uh, essential and non-essential. Uh, and so it made uh, uh, digital education an essential thing to have. You can't have options. If you're a president of university of the university and you don't have a strategy for, for having distance learning, you shouldn't be the president of that university. You're in trouble. You've been caught off guard. You didn't take this seriously. 
and uh, 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 and so the, the the investor community is watching because we've all been saying it is going to happen. When is it going to happen? We are just there's this incredible anticipation, and suddenly we uh, uh, as investors and as as fathers, as people that care about co our communities. Uh, we're so happy that we have it here. Let me say just a couple of things so that I don't take uh, uh, much longer than this. I think there is, uh, this gives global access. This democratizes education. Uh, and I'm posing questions here for my friends who are in education. Uh, what, uh, when I say democratizing, it means the availability, right? So it's, all, uh, it's out there. People can pick and choose where they want to go, what they want to study. Uh, uh, and maybe you don't, maybe, uh, and Safwan could, could answer that. Maybe we don't need degrees the way we, were, we had degrees. Uh, uh, maybe we need to specialize in specific skill sets that we take courses from different places. You don't need to have a course uh, uh, from, from a course uh, program from one place. I mean, there is, you know, this, this digital stuff and this ability to access and this ability to uh, to even go to the best universities of the world, like Columbia, and be at home. I don't have to fly to New York and become a student there. It reduces cost. It, it makes it available. So, I mean, all of these things are quite interesting, and that's why investors will invest in them. And that's why I think they are here to stay, and everybody has to put a really serious strategy for it. Yeah. Um, if, if, I, if I may respond uh, to that, I mean, first of all, I do agree that it is here to stay. And I do agree that the universities and there are a number of second tier universities in the United States that did not pivot quickly enough and did, did not have the proper investment in their technological infrastructure. And they faltered um, in the process. Um, how those will survive uh, the future is uh, is a question. It's a big question mark. So I do agree with Fadi that something is here to stay. Uh, what I would add to it is, or maybe what I would challenge it is, what is the it? And the it is going to look very different uh, to different people and in different contexts and to different universities. Um, you know, the, the potential for uh, technology and for technology investment, I do think, I also agree, is huge. I mean, you know, we know that online education is still less than 2% of the global higher education market, less than 2%. So the market is, is unquestionably uh, ripe for a disruption. The global higher education market, by the way, had, was valued uh, just before the pandemic at $65.4 billion in 2019. And it was projected to reach $118 billion by 2027. So for you investors and people who deal in that field, uh, I do agree with, uh, with Fadi that uh, there's definitely huge potential. Now, the, I don't think we will ever go to, and something Munira also touched on, I don't think we will ever go to a, an exclusively online environment in education. I personally don't think we should. Okay, there is something that is lost when everything happens online. And uh, back to your question, Tiska, is that, you know, one of the frustrations, of course, for students, one of the concerns is uh, what they're missing out on in terms of the college experience uh, by doing everything virtually. I've always believed that you learn more outside of the classroom at a place like Columbia than you do in the classroom. And what you learn inside the classroom is quite substantial. Uh, but it is the entire experience of um, learning how to navigate your way um, around a community and society and the university and all of that um, is, 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 is very critical. So I want to give... Think, sorry, hmm. do you think that it will actually democratize education or is it likely to create a two-tier system where those who can afford to go to the university will have access and aren't yeah. restricted? By travel restrictions will you know could be considered the, the upper crest of um right nation and the rest of us will have a lower tiered uh, form yeah. of online education i think we will have both i think we will have both it's not an either or online education is meant to democratize access to education okay but let me footnote this with a very big footnote and that is 
uh, we need to be careful about uh, in considering access. I mean, as it is now, uh, access is not only, of course, you know, geographic and so on, but socioeconomic. Only 40% of students from lower income households um, in, the, in a recent survey have reported being able to get the necessary equipment for remote learning. And only 56% of students from low income households uh, reported having reliable internet access. Okay, uh, and an even smaller number reported that their home environment could support remote learning. So yes, it democratizes, uh, but in a way it is those that you want to democratize it for, those whom you want to uh, provide an education for that they otherwise would not be able to get, are the ones that are uh, socioeconomically or geographically marginalized in such a manner uh, that access for them is, is going to be very difficult. So if we're looking at democratization and if we're looking at making online education a viable model, we need to look at some structural aspects of, um, of, of, of all of this. So let me, let me just finish this thought by saying that I think you know, there's no question, we're not going to emerge after the pandemic and the Columbia University is going to say, okay, great, online was wonderful, it served us very well over the past year or two years, now let's go back to doing things the way that we did before COVID. That's not going to happen. I think that that is not going to happen at all. But will we become an online platform exclusively? Absolutely not. I think yet you will find is that the hybrid approach is going to be very popular. And to the other part of your question, um, there will be different years. I think the, uh, the you know, the elite universities, uh, hate to use that word, but they are, uh, will continue, I think, along the lines of a model that has been proven um, and, and is tried and true, but that will have to become far more uh, adaptive. Uh, the second and third tier universities, I think we will find squeezing out of a number of them because of the financial hit that they have taken, because of their inability to adapt. Let's not forget that during the Great Depression of the 1930s, a considerable number um, of uh, universities in North America shut down. And I think that we should expect to find some universities shut down over the next 10 years. But at the same time, you will find other universities that prove to be robust and agile and technologically savvy uh, that will re-emerge or will emerge to uh, follow along the path that Mr. Gandur is, um, uh, is, is projecting, and that is to become largely online deliverers of education. Which will shift the entire business model of the universities and schools. Um, Absolutely. It's already being shifted, but we can come back to that. <laughs> I mean, did, can universities justify the high um, tuition fees, if you know you are changing it, you're, you, for some students you won't be able to provide the full on-campus experience. So Columbia can. I mean, let me let me just be very very frank about it. Let's not forget, by the way, tuition and fees make up only twenty six percent of revenues. Uh, for a four-year public institution. For private institutions, it can go up to 35%. So under the best of circumstances, it's only about one-third of the total um, revenue stream for a university. A university like Columbia relies on five main sources of revenue, and all of those have been hit badly by the uh, crisis. Tuition is only one of them, but there's gifts, there's endowment income, there's research, uh, revenue and there's clinical practice through hospital and through medical schools and so on and so forth. Um, it, you know, there have been, uh, there's been a lot written about and talked about um, in terms of tuition going down uh, when all that you're doing is doing online. I think the trick to deal with this is twofold. One, um, a university like Columbia cannot afford to only put things online. Okay, it had to for the second part of the spring semester, but going forward, it has to enhance the pedagogic experience and also complement it with other non-pedagogical um, uh, aspects of the, of the college experience. Um, I think for uh, universities that do it well, the online um, education delivery model is not necessarily uh, less expensive than the physical one. Yes, there are some aspects of the physical 
uh, that are more expensive and certainly in terms of facilities and so on. But in terms of how faculty are being used, in terms of the additional things that one has to use. So it really all depends. I mean, it's a difficult question to answer broadly and generally. It all depends on what it is that you are offering, you know, what your value proposition is that can justify the same tuition rates. And in many cases, you will not be able to justify that. So what you will have to do, and this is where I go to the second tier universities, you have to massively increase your scale and be able to reduce your tuition um, uh, charges. Uh, so I think you will have the two tier uh, model that you referred to earlier. Manila, is it easy to scale, particularly in the region where a lot of the um, institutions are centralized? You know, their budgets, their curriculum is determined by the, the government. Um, I think it's still difficult to scale. Uh, but uh, what we are seeing is that scalability is going to become easier over the next couple of, uh, uh, I would say, years, one to two years, because we're already seeing regulatory changes that are encouraging the sector or people in the ecosystem to go online. Um, so for example, just in the last two months, we've seen the ministry um, uh, in Saudi Arabia starting to attest uh, higher education certificates and approve, uh, approve higher education degrees that have been done or uh, that have been taken online. This wasn't the case uh, you know, prior to COVID. Uh, we've seen new regulations that uh, link online professional development to actual career progression. This is an actual came out in the last month. Again, this encourages people to go online and to seek uh, online degrees and professional development. So the more we see enabling policies when it comes to decentralization, when it comes to support, when it comes to public-private partnerships uh, with governments, um, I think that's definitely uh, to uh, support with scalability and adoption. Um, we still have um, a key question, at least from our customers, um, and there is a learning curve that's happening right now. It, um, are online degrees, for example, accepted by government or attested by government? So we're seeing this learning curve happen and it's only going upward and we don't see it uh, going backward. Um, another thing um, that we expect to see happening is a little bit of decentralization in the sector to allow schools and districts to make their own decisions. So when the government decided to go fully online, um, there are two decisions to make here. Either you centralize all of this or you decentralize this and you allow districts to make their decision for what works. And you work with different companies to solve local solutions. And we also think that this is going to be heading this way, even with China the most centralized education system, they decentralized their online learning movement. What they did, they only centralized examination, which is what Professor Safwan was talking about. So Colombia moved to pass fail, but for the um, examinations in China, they centralized this through a government system. Um, uh, other than that, all ed tech companies in, in China were participating in the move uh, to go online. Um, the other question that I think is going to be important for us as, um, as startups in the sector is who is going to fund this digital transformation? Where is the funding going to come from? Is it going to be government funding? Is it going to be uh, investor funding? Um, uh, this is a massive digital transformation you're talking about. So where is the money going to come from? Um, and that's something that, you know, we're following and um, an important uh, uh, thing, to, uh, thing to follow over the next uh, couple of years. So yes, there will be uh, an increase in, in uh, investor funding, but also uh, how government and other private sector are gonna play um, in, in uh, this specific sector. I, I want to also comment on what uh, um, the gentleman said on, uh, on access. I think access is key. Definitely the online education will enable access. But the, the two things we need to answer going forward is who's going to give the best learning experience online. It's all going to be about learning experience for the student. Access is going to be there, but how are you going to teach me? Um, and this, by the way, started in 2012. The only thing Corona did is it's a point of no return right now. So in 2012, after the MOOCs, you know, the Harvard and MIT trial with the edX platform, that was uh, transformational for higher education to say, I'm bringing this elite education to everybody all around the world for free. So they already did it. They did the test. They, they, they were learning about um, what the best learning experience online should look like. 
Um, but today, this is where the innovation will happen. And this is where the real ed tech players will emerge. Who Do you think that was successful, the, the uh, Coursera edX? I mean, the course completion rates were very low. And it just tended to be the same sort of middle class people who already had university degrees that were doing these courses. So was it the right way to actually increase access? Um, I, I think it, it uh, went in stages. So it was successful when it started. You know, it was this new hype. Everybody's learning online. You had higher completion rates. We are seeing the completion rates definitely uh, uh, fall sometimes below 5%. Um, and the key question now, so it was successful to an extent. And what we're seeing with these business models is they're shifting to corporate training. So if you look at Coursera, it started with free online, free education for all. Then they start. They went to verify certificates. Then they moved to corporate training and membership. So the business model is shifting and shifting very fast. So from 2012 to 2020 to test all these business model, it's shifting very fast because they're all trying to find the right learning experience um, and how. Fadi, how important do you think is the private sector's input into the actual curriculum? It's huge. I mean, look, this this is not only disruptive for the for the for university students or for uh, school uh, uh, teachers or students. This is uh, this is disruptive for anyone that is in the business of learning, of acquiring skills, of acquiring knowledge. Uh, it is uh, it's it's uh, it's changing everything, and and I, I guess. You know, with, with corporates, it's going to be a different ballgame because, uh, you know, there is uh, what Safwan was talking about earlier, the, the campus experience, the life at university experience, what you learn over there. I mean, I, for me, if you ask me what you learned at the university, the only thing I remember is that I had fun learning. I was in Washington, D.C., enjoying life and, and learning things that I didn't learn when I was in Amman. So, I mean, that... That learning experience, I still remember. Uh, I remember a few teachers here and there, with all due respect to teachers. Uh, but uh, but yes, the the interaction with the students and 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 that that is where 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 people move from being uh, teenagers to becoming adults, uh, and that's huge. You can't take that away. But for you, for corporates, it's a different ball game. I mean, they 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 have their own campuses, their own uh, work environments. But giving access to knowledge to their uh, to their employees to their people on a global basis is essential, and that's why you probably see more adoption. You probably see business models that make more money because corporates will spend money, will tell their employees that they have to go through these courses, etc., etc., etc. So there is there is that. Uh, uh, deep pockets that allow you to do that. But let me let me just comment on a, on a couple of things relating to education, uh, investment, infrastructure. Uh, you know, back to access, back to digital divide, uh, back to digital connectivity. So, look, I think what Corona is going to do for us is it is going to bring the digital access story uh, right to where water access is and electricity access is. Mm. It is becoming a human right. Right, mm. you cannot. Governments, uh, I think you will suddenly see now SDGs uh, uh, being adapted. You know, United Nations like these fads and whatever. World Bank will say, oh, it's a human right now that you have to have access. And all governments will start running. I am going to have, a, 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 you know, equal access for everyone digitally. And everyone will have an iPad or a whatever so that they can access line. There is no escaping that, by the way. I mean, it's, it's there. And and uh, no no government can 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 actually uh, uh, be out of that uh, process because at the end of the day, if you're saying from from uh, from uh, from KG one to KG five, you must have all your uh, all our kids. It's a uh, it's what in the constitution to have access to education. Well, you have to have access to digital education now as part of your constitution as a country. So you will find that debate going online. I mean, there's no question about it. Right. Who is going to invest in this? It's going to be two tiered, right? Two tiered. I mean, look at the look look at uh, at the traditional tech investing. So it starts with DARPA, uh, uh, the American Defense Department research, and they, they throw out massive amounts of grants. And then all sorts of research pops up because there is no financial return. It's much more patient capital. It is about uh, the impact. It is about the national uh, 
competitiveness. It is about uh, it's a different story. So, which means VCs and venture capital will not invest in research that they don't know what is going to come out of. And then suddenly, what works uh, in Army or in in uh, in in DARPA suddenly goes to Silicon Valley and it becomes commercialized. Think of it this way. Uh, I think the sovereign wealth funds of our region, I think uh, governments in our region will start will need to start thinking strategically uh, about uh, uh, how to uh, to enable the, the the online experience because there is an offline experience, but the challenge and I'll finish here and maybe Safwan and uh, Munira can 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 answer to this challenge. And my big question is what happens to our local universities and our, uh, our schools? So suddenly when there's adoption and we know our students go and have access to classes wherever they want now, right? Mm. So uh, uh, mediocrity becomes uh, questioned uh, if you're not offering the top of the line, if, if you're doing teacher training, Munira, I mean, teacher training uh, is, 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 uh, uh, is enabling our teachers to teach our kids skills. And you can have access globally now, right? You mm. can do it through ANAB and you can do it through any platform. And if ANAB is not way up there in, its, in, its, uh, in what it's uh, uh, teaching and what's making available, it's going to suffer because we have access. And that's the question of access and democratization. Because uh, uh, yes, there are the digital divides, but there is, uh, when you say 50% of the people are connected, it means there is a huge amount of people that are connected and are going to tell you what are you going sure. to offer me because I have access somewhere else now? Sure. And it is going to be less expensive. I'll give a, a final example. Skillshare is a company in the US today, which I happen to subscribe to. It's a subscription-based model. I pay about $100 a year, $100 a year, and I get access to short-form short, short uh, form courses, short-term, you know, uh, five minutes and then another five minutes, and then it becomes an hour. It teaches you a skill. But at $100 a year, that's $10 a month. And that is democratization, in my view. Yeah. I think, I mean, you know, the, the, uh, that's very, very powerful. And uh, the notion that uh, access to technology becomes a human right, becomes an SDG, uh, is a really fascinating idea. And I, and I agree with that. I mean, it has become as important as everything else. I mean, education is a human right, right? I mean, you know, we the world has adopted that. So if education is a human right, then access to education uh, is clearly a human right. And access is, to the extent it is dependent on technology, then access to technology becomes a human right. Um, I think, you know, on the, the just following uh, on the, the notion of uh, uh, access and uh, democratization. Uh, so you look at what online education has done uh, to reach refugee populations. And this is something I and the Columbia Global Centers have been involved in. Um, university of the People is a new university that is entirely an online platform and it's been focusing all of its efforts over the past couple of years on developing its curricula in Arabic, targeting Syrian refugees in particular. I mean, that's the kind of thing that even goes beyond democratization and it speaks to what Fadi is saying in terms of education uh, and access to education being a human right. Um, now, the issue of uh, quality and um, equitable quality, if you will, that Fadi uh, raised, I think is also a very, very interesting one because once you're online, you can't hide, you can't hide uh, the good or the bad, right? And so there has already been a shift that I see towards um, leveraging, for example, the best educators in large platforms online. So, so, you know, within the same university, but I think we will increasingly see that across universities and especially in the K through 12 uh, education system. So, you know, if Munira is, the best teacher alive of chemistry, okay? With virtual learning uh, and, and virtual platforms, I can make sure that millions, not tens, not hundreds of students have access to her. And then you supplement that with other types of um, teaching models uh, that may be more seminar focused and so on and so forth. So that's already starting to happen and that's being welcomed. So both the excellent teaching of Munira becomes a public good. It's no longer a private exclusive good. Uh, and by the same token, my 
less than great uh, teaching skills um, in need of being sharpened also becomes something that one can put a finger on and try to deal with. Let me just add one more thing on the, the limits to online education, it's something that I'm facing uh, myself. So I've been working with the deans of all 16 schools at Columbia in thinking about what next year is going to look like. Uh, it's going to look very differently for the undergraduate colleges, and then it will for the graduate schools, and the graduate schools are going to look very different from one another. What do I mean by that? 95% of our undergraduates at Columbia live in dormitories, okay? So to bring them back to campus, um, where they are sharing rooms and dining halls and community rooms is, is next to impossible, okay? So the model that we will use for the undergraduates is most likely to be a hybrid model uh, that relies heavily on online education. The university has not made any final decision, so this is conjecture on my part. But when I talk to the graduate deans, some, like uh, in, in the more technical and skill building professional fields, can work with online and can offer flexibility. So we've now moved to a three term year, so that spring, summer, and fall are equal in terms of length and in terms of importance. So we give flexibility to students in terms of when they start and when they finish. And you complement the rest with online. But when I talk to my colleagues who run the School of the Arts or the School of Architecture, their work is all studio-based. How can you do that virtually? The simple answer is you cannot, okay? So I think you know, there are limitations to online. I can teach math, I can teach chemistry online. Much more difficult to teach some humanities courses um, in music, for example, or in, uh, in, in art um, um, online. So I just wanted to uh, throw that out there to say that the, to go back to the original theme that you brought up, which is the, uh, the, the, the multiple tiers. I don't even want to say two tier. There will be multiple tiers um, in higher education as a result of this. So why do you think that uh, universities and other institutions will become more localized and go two different countries go directly to the students and build centers yeah and become another revenue stream as well so i'd like to say that we anticipated corona 10 years ago when we set up a network of global centers around the world um, but uh, whatever it was you know the vision that our president had 10 years ago to set up these uh, centers around the world i think uh, was prescient and uh, um, i think the short answer is yes you know we need to be out there um, and reach students where, where they are. Uh, you look at international students who across Colombia make up 26% of our student body, okay? It varies from school to school, but uh, it's 26% of the total. International students are not going to be going to the United States or to New York in the fall. I just don't see that happening. You know, new students, visa restrictions, travel restrictions, all that kind of stuff. So what I'm doing, what we're doing is leveraging the nine locations we have around the world and exploring pop-up centers in places where we do not have uh, university presence, depending on local conditions vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic and the environment and so on. Uh, we're trying to be creative in terms of offering opportunities for students to come together um, to also compensate for the non-pedagogic aspects of the uh, campus environment. It's not the same as being on campus in New York, but if I go to Reed Hall in Paris, um, and I'm around other students from Columbia University who are congregating there and we are um, involved in and engaged in uh, different campus-like activities, uh, then that will help uh, compensate for this. But, but, you know, Fadi asked a very important question, maybe Munira can, um, can talk about this, is what happens to the local um, university when more online? I mean, I, my brief answer is a very hopeful one. Um, hopeful, but not entirely optimistic, uh, that that will raise the bar, that that will raise the bar, um, just as, uh, you know, the metaphor that I use with, with teachers uh, not being able to hide, uh, the local is no longer being considered um, relative to what else is local. It is now part of a global uh, benchmarking mechanism. Yeah, I'm totally aligned with that, actually, because what we're seeing now globally is a large global experiment of redesigning higher education. Um, and, you know, universities that are able to align themselves with, with what is happening globally, I think, are the ones 
um, that will be able to keep up with the change. Um, so, and you know, they were talking about this just last year, but no one really paid attention to the articles that were written about this, but they were th saying, you know, higher education is kind of gonna be like Netflix. It's gonna be bundled and unbundled into smaller and modular courses. And, and really nobody paid attention to any of these articles, but it was gonna be on demand. It was gonna be shorter. Um, you were gonna bundle specific courses together to learn specific skills. Today, um, there is a large experiment of redesigning higher education to fit that uh, on-demand modular uh, approach uh, that you know, we see happening. Definitely, uh, local universities are going to be pro uh, propelled forward, um, and they need to be supported by their local governments as well to do that, um, either through the right international partnerships or the right private sector partnerships, because our universities, at least in Saudi, I'm talking, they are large universities with large number of student bodies, um, and if they are unable to keep up with this change, it's going to uh, really affect, uh, um, you know, their their growth and development. We are seeing a lot of programs now that are very learning to earning, very focused on technical and vocational training as well. Uh, and this is another area we haven't spoke spoken about, but that uh, is also uh, going to be growing in the next couple of years and enabled by technology. Uh, we do see as well that the traditional academic sectors are learning from the technology sector. So, for example, you have the, uh, let's say, the cybersecurity short programs that are bundled nicely. Other uh, academic sectors can, you know, follow these type of, um, you know, uh, programs that directly lead to employment. So we see that happening a lot as well uh, in higher education. Um, basically, there's going to be a, a restructuring of the whole sector. Uh, some schools are going to go out of business for sure. We've seen it, at least in Saudi. Um, there is a reduction in uh, the number of uh, teachers as well that are going to be working next year in their staff by 20 to 30 percent. Um, some schools have been hit in their tuition. Uh, it goes up to 40 percent of their revenue. So schools that are unable to redesign the learning experience will go out of business uh, very soon. Yep. You know, on the, the I, um, sorry, go ahead, Fadi. I just wanted to say a couple of things. One, I mean, this is what disruption is all about. When, sure. when, when you say schools are unable to catch up and, and change their business models, we need to call them business models or sustainability models. Uh, that's, that's a huge question. And, and you know, it, it disrupts a lot of people's lives. So you need to pivot to something else. But what I wanted to mention here is what Safwan said about pop-up centers. I mean, that's fascinating, right? So that's exactly what I'm saying when I'm talking about democratization. Imagine, imagine, so let's assume, I hope not, inshallah, that this, this pandemic thing uh, takes a couple of more years because we can't find the vaccine, right? And imagine that uh, you at Columbia are going to have these pop-up centers and there's all sorts of new experiences that you didn't know about before because you can't do this exp these experiences. They are forced on us and so you have to ac actually dig deep into them and make them happen. So, uh, and then what happens when these things work, <laughs> right? <laughs> when these things really work and people love them and, and, and so what, what happens? So am I going to have... Uh, uh, will you ever say no, no more pop-ups? No way you're going to say no, or no more pop-ups. So you're going to have to live a completely new life and the universities have to rediscover what it means to be on campus. Is on campus meaning in New York or is on campus be living in the pop-up center that you've opened locally? And look at what happens to the world when you get access to, I mean, because we're Columbia garage, I'm not, but you are. Uh, uh, look at what happens to the world when you get local Colombias all over the place because you have these pop-ups and I have access to the best teachers, the best professors, the most incredible courses in the world in a pop-up sometime somewhere downtown Jeddah, downtown Amman or downtown uh, Dubai. Look at again what happens to the disruption to the local educators and the local, uh, uh, the local uh, uh, regulators. I end here. I think we should open it up for maybe some of the people because there's some good questions out there. Yeah, um, so we have a question from Shamima who says, we all agree education and its process should change. Who should be driving that change or innovation, the government, teachers or students? 
Safwan, would you like to Munira. answer? Munira, sure. this is for you or for Safwan. <laughs> Yalla, go. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, I think all of the above and then some. Um, I mean, change um, is, is, is rarely uh, led from uh, one corner, right? It has to happen on all levels. I mean, um, and, and to use an example from outside of uh, education, when we look at the Black Lives Matter uh, movement in the United States, uh, we just had a webinar on this yesterday. And, you know, one of the conclusions is that structural changes have to take place for cultural changes to take place. That requires education, that requires societal changes, that requires changes in terms of how the judiciary deals with these things, um, employment, police reform, and so on and so forth. So just to take it out of this context for a second. So I think it will have to come uh, from, from all of the above. Uh, Munira, maybe in addressing this, you can address a question that I have for you, which is um, very relevant at the school level, much more so than at the university level. Um, so any of us who has small kids um, has had a very, very tough time over the past uh, few months, right? Yeah, you do. Okay, so you can speak from personal experience. So as we move further and further online, in the K through 12 um, uh, system, what impact will that have on family life? What impact does that have on uh, the performance and the productivity of, uh, of parents, um, you know, in, in increasingly, um, you know, two parent working uh, families? So uh, perhaps maybe you can answer that question for me. I'll, I'll have an attempt, I'll take a stab at it, but diff difficult question, because I suffered as well. So uh, just to get back to the uh, uh, at Shamima's question, um, I totally agree with Professor Safwan. Uh, there's a saying that I always say in Arabic is, meaning education mm. is the responsibility of all. Uh, we always have the idea that education is the responsibility of a ministry or government or public funding or no, but it's really everybody's responsibility. The student is shaping what they want to learn. The parent is putting pressure on the school for what they want this, their kid to learn. Um, the teacher uh, as well has ideas on what students should learn. So it's really everybody's responsibility to shape and transform the sector. And we should allow that to happen. When you don't allow that to happen, innovation doesn't happen in the sector. You should allow the technology companies to contribute, the civil societies to contribute. The biggest movements in education happened from parents. When you're talking mm -hmm. about, for example, the disability uh, rights movement for children with disability in the US, it was a parent-driven movement. So we should mm -hmm. allow everyone to innovate in the sector so it becomes a little bit more fluid. So that's my answer to, to that question. To the online um, question, so what, what we're seeing is that the, the, those that will be most affected are, uh, uh, you know, two um, uh, audiences in the sector. The kids who are zero to three, so the really younger kids uh, that uh, re uh, didn't have the opportunity or the access to really interact with the environment now with COVID, and these really need to be in schools. They really need to interact with the environment. So there are limitations to online learning. So even if the sector is growing financially or the sector is being restructured, those that are most affected are the marginalized kids and the early years, under five. All children under five, they really need to be in schools. And uh, this has affected parents. Uh, it has affected parents' well-being because the parents' role has also changed. So what you're seeing now is counselors talking to parents and mothers uh, about their new role of being teachers at home. This is a new job for counselors, which wasn't there before. Uh, so uh, I think governments around the world are trying to find a way to bring back the younger kids to school because this will be very challenging for parents. Um, what we are going to be seeing happening definitely is a hybrid model. And children will adapt to this hybrid model and parents will adapt to the hybrid model. It will probably, Professor Safwan, my view is it will not be in the early years. Mm. Not, uh, maybe after year seven, you will start to see schools going, you have the online option or you have the, because the older kids have more time management skills and they're able to manage their time and they're less headache for their parents. If they're special needs kids, these kids were se severely affected by the move online. So online is great, but it's not for everyone. So we have to, you know, uh, tread uh, carefully 
especially when we are talking about the online movement and, and going online. I'm wary of the time, we only have two minutes left, but there are a couple of questions uh, regarding about um, our understanding of edtech and whether it will redefine um, whether we care about degrees, bachelors or masters, or whether, will edtech push our understanding of education to another direction? And also, um, Javed asks, how do you see uh, college education in 2030? So I think uh, can I add this? Can I add a man? Uh, uh, this is for Safwan and Munira, obviously, because I'm not in this business. But uh, you know, the United States government just signed uh, the president of the United States yesterday or the day before signed that they are it, the government is going to hire based on skills, not on degrees. I mean, how huge is that? You know, he they want to. Uh, I don't know if this is good or bad. I'm just putting it out there. Uh, uh, I can tell you in in. Uh, I don't, uh, I'm not interested in my businesses to hire based on college degrees. I'm interested on in your skill set. I'm interested in what you've done in, in the past three years, not in the past 10 years. I want to know what you've been doing in the past two or three years, because that's a relevant skill set. Because skills, as you know, die if you don't completely replenish them. So when the United States government says, I'm not hiring based on, on degrees, what happens? Mm. So I'll, uh, I'll give you maybe some confusion conflicting answers to that question, Triska. Um, the, you look at uh, the strongest and largest economy in Europe, Germany, right? Uh, if my statistics are correct, if my recollection is, is, is accurate, about one third of Germans actually graduate with a college degree, okay? What happens to the rest? They go to great vocational schools. So Fadi is right, okay? It is about skills. Um, I don't think that the president of the United States knows the difference between skills and education, and, and, but we'll put that aside. Uh, but it is what kind of skills and what quality of skills, right? Um, in the United States, about 50% um, of Americans actually acquire a college degree. I'm in Jordan right now, where the situation is not that different from Saudi Arabia, where Munira is, or other countries in the region. I would venture to say that more than 90% of the population has college degrees, okay? But they sit home unemployed, right? Because they, you know, what value is a college degree in biology if I'm not going to get a, uh, a proper job with that skill? And then the Fadi and tours of the world need skills for jobs that they cannot fill because they don't have appropriately skilled people. So I think the whole notion of over-reliance on college degrees uh, needs to be re-examined, uh, but also with that re-examination is what are we providing as an alternative in terms of proper vocational skill, uh, schooling and proper skills development. Now, having said all of this, where the contradiction might come is that there is, you know, to me, a college education for those who can afford it, okay, is really about preparation for life. It's not about skills. You know, when I'm asked by young people, well, what should I major? And I'm focusing on this, but maybe I should pursue that. I say, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, you're, you're in at Columbia as a college student to cultivate your intellectual curiosity to cultivate your intellectual curiosity, to be prepared for life so that you're always learning and you're always able to engage yourself and engage in society intellectually. If Fadi is going to hire you, he's going to hire you because you have the right uh, values and you have, uh, you know, you, you, you can learn the skills. You're smart enough and you're a good enough person and then the skills will come with it. So, so I agree with that. And I think just finally, um, the implicit um, conclusion in this is because there's this huge disruption um, and because the whole question of pursuing a college uh, degree at this point is being put to question because of the disruption of Corona and because of technology disruption, those questions I think are going to be more in the fore and uh, hopefully there will be less focus on a college degree for the sake of a college degree. And I'll stop there. Munira, you want to I, add something? Yeah, I just have a question actually for um, Professor Safwan is um, how are colleges measuring skills? Because this is what we want. It is about preparation for life, but um, I think the next shift for colleges is going to be about measuring skills. 
telling me that your graduate exactly what are the skills uh, skill sets that they have and i think that's where colleges didn't get it yet i mean i'm a columbia grad oxford and they still didn't measure my skills i just have a degree they didn't tell me what skills i have after graduation i know what skills i acquired but it's how are colleges and universities going to be measuring skills in the future yeah that's a great question uh, for which I don't have a good answer, I don't think. I mean, don't forget, you went to, um, I don't know what you did at Oxford, but Columbia, you went to graduate school, right? Where implicit in that is skill acquisition. And depending on what it is that you focused on, you know, whether it was child psychology or what have you at Teachers College, one would hope and assume that you got those skills along the way. Uh, but, you know, are we going to have a, an exit exam uh, sort of uh, to, um, I don't think that that will happen just because of uh, the way that universities are to some extent stuck in the way that they're doing things and because of the, um, of the, uh, the scale issue. Uh, but I think, you know, somebody like Fadi, a business person, would tell you the best measure of skill acquisition is employment you know if you enter the uh, uh, the workforce and you're not skilled that kind of information will find its way back to the school from which you graduated uh, I think over over time and so there is a self-regulating market regulating mechanism uh, that I think keeps universities on their toes business schools where I spent um, the, you know, the major part of my career, um, we relied very heavily on what the recruiters were telling us um, about the skill set that we are uh, um, graduating and, um, and sending their way. All right, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up here. Thank you to our panelists and thanks to all the attendees. Gambia Global Centers are mine. Um, I'm going to end it with uh, what uh, Shamima has said, which is the answer is lifelong learning. I think with EdTech, we're going to be forced to constantly um, upskill and reskill. So uh, thank you all once again.